it is like so exciting to see all of you in here. I'm I'm just really excited to be here. Um, my name is Greer Rivers. I'm here to talk to you guys today about dialogue and um, it says Greg Rivers on the transcript, but I'm Greer and um, I have a PowerPoint for you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and set it up. Um, let's see, share screen. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Um, so just to kind of check, what can everyone see right now? I just want to make sure. Um, can you guys see my PowerPoint? <laughs> okay, my book's perfect. Okay, well, here's my face first. Um, so say it right. This is the say it right intro. And um, we're going to be talking today a little bit about writing and dialogue. So first of all, my name is Greer. Um, I'm a little under the weather today. Uh, I have been, I went to Vegas like a couple of weeks ago and I got caught a cold or something. And so my, my voice might try and give out, but I'm going to do my best. Um, there it goes. <laughs> so I'm actually a self-published romance author. Um, I like to say I was a crime fighter in a suit before this, meaning that I was a prosecutor. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> and I uh, prosecuted domestic violence, sexual assault, and driving under the influence crimes. Um, and so that kind of suspense that's like inherent in those crimes wasn't that far of a stretch for me to go to romantic suspense. Um, I've actually always written. Um, I've written forever. But in January, January 1st, 2020, um, I told myself I was going to finally publish something and I wanted to be a published author. So I read about craft. I listened to tons of podcasts and I write my first romance. I wrote my first romance book. <laughs> we don't normally do that. Um, again, please feel free to talk in the chat. I am going to try and stay on here, but if you have any questions, definitely ask me and I will do my best to answer those too. Um, let's see, there's a Q&A button. Okay, we've got that now. Okay, so I published my first book February, 2021. It's that red one, The Red Shoes, Escaping Conviction. Um, and since then I've published eight books. Um, a six book romantic suspense series, that was all the shoes. And then um, a dark Phantom of the Opera retelling, that's the bottom right. And then the bottom left is a sports romance that I co-wrote. Um, the top right comes out next spring, uh, but my books have made it to the top 100 in the Kindle store and hit bestsellers list on Amazon. And now my husband, um, I get to have him working with me on the business side. Uh, and today I get to talk to you guys about my favorite thing, which is writing craft. I'm a nerd for it. <laughs> and um, we're going to be talking today about the purpose of dialogue and how to make your dialogue work for you. Um, this is a crash course, so I'm trying to get a lot in here. Hopefully, um, hopefully it gives you some insight on it. And um, we're going to talk about when to use dialogue, when not to use dialogue, how to make your dialogue um, as rich as possible, how to make it look pretty, because that's something I didn't really even think about until I published my second book. And um, we're also going to talk about romance specific dialogue. So um, if you want to in the chat, tell everybody what kind of genre that you like to write. Um, I am obviously a romance author. And so a lot of people don't think that romance is a non romance lovers think that romance is just, you know, not for them, but romance specific dialogue can be very helpful, I think, across genres. Okay, good. We have like a good mix so far. Um, romantic fantasy is my favorite, by the way. <laughs> also stick around because there are details on how to win a $20 Amazon gift card and an ebook. And um, 
there's also a feedback survey and an invite to join my newsletter. So, um, and again, ask questions, chat, say hello. Oh, I'm loving all these answers. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is, you know, the quick definitions. I, um, uh, these are mostly self-explanatory, but these are, there are some that I didn't understand until like tragically too late, honestly. So the verse is dialogue. That's pretty self-explanatory conversation between two or more people. There's also internal dialogue, which is, you know, when the main character is kind of talking to herself out like inwardly, but out loud to the reader, if that makes sense. It's usually the italicized um, first or italicized first person present type of dialogue. Um, and so it's it's noted by that, if, especially if there's like a different um, POV or tense. Uh, but we're not gonna be talking a lot about that. We're gonna be talking more about actual dialogue between two or more people. Um, the next is dialect, which is the language that is peculiar to a specific region or social group. So dialect is really important, I think, to kind of share with the reader where and who and um, what your character believe. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. There's also action beats. Uh, those show what a character is doing before, during, or after their dialogue. Um, action beats ha aren't talking about the voice. They're not talking about what is being said. Um, they're talking about everything around it. So we're talking gestures, movements, facial expressions made by the character. Um, they also can help set the scene and prevent what's called white box syndrome, where you have two blobs talking in a white room. You know, action beats can say um, someone is chatting and while they're chatting, they pull a book from the library or they pull a book from the bookshelf that tells you they're in a library or in a living room versus, you know, white box. <laughs> it also can be helpful to show what the character is feeling, helps identify who is talking. Um, and it's accompanied usually with a period in the sentence. We have an example, Sarah's face crumpled. Why would you do this to me? Poor Sarah. And then we also have dialogue tags. Um, those are used strictly to indicate who is speaking. Um, and that is like how they are speaking or what they are saying. So Sarah, that said, <clears throat> that's warbled, cried, laughed, and, uh, you know, administered or commanded, demanded, that kind of thing. Um, they're usually active verbs, and uh, they accompany a comma, or a, company, a comma accompanies them in a sentence with a lowercase word behind it, unless um, there's a question. Sorry, I accidentally pressed the button. Um, unless it's an exclamation or a question. And here we have the example, why would you do this to me, Sarah whispered. And, um, or you did this to me, she sobbed quietly. Next, we'll talk about the purpose of your dialogue. So um, dialogue is never just dialogue or cut it out. Um, everything has a reason in your books. Everything must have a purpose. Um, you must have a goal for everything you do. When I was in law school, they impressed upon us how busy people are. And um, you never want to waste the judge or the lawyer or the client's time, that kind of situation. Same thing goes for your reader, you know. Um, whatever you do in your book, you need to be able to have an explanation to your reader. Also, remember that any rule that I'm telling you or anyone tells you, honestly, um, any rule or thing to be remembered can be trumped by being able to explain why you did something. Um, so again, never waste your reader's time and energy and put value in everything right down to a single period or comma. Um, like you should be able, your goal should be if a reader points at something, you should have an answer as to why you said it or why the character said it. Um, this ways to do that or making your dialogue work for you. Um, as in also enhancing the story or character. Dialogue can be used for exposition or backstory or setting. Um, it, you can weave it in. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's also a great way to get to know your characters and um, reveal the plot. What does the character 
need to know? What does the reader need to know? These are not often or not always the same thing. And sometimes what you don't say is just as important or what the character doesn't say is just as important. Um, so as far as weaving dialogue into exposition, we have a quote up here from one of my favorite songs. Um, no, I can't help but to hear an exchanging of words. So just, I don't know where everyone at, is at in their um, writing journey. So just to explain what definition, uh, the definition of exposition is, exposition is the background information of a story. It's when the background is introduced, the setting, the conflict, the history, the backstory, um, all of that is introduced. And it's usually at the beginning, but it can be woven throughout too. Um, but dialogue can help break that up a little bit. Dialogue shows versus tells. Um, exposition is usually like the beginning, probably the first 12% um, of the book. And dialogue breaks up wordy expositional paragraphs and chapters. Dialogue is something to remember is dialogue creates action. If no one is talking, often that means that the reader doesn't know what's valuable or what's important. Um, and what the character says directs the reader to what's important. And um, for example, like if you're watching a movie and you see a group of people walking around on a ship, uh, like a space shuttle or something like that, but no one's talking. You don't know who's important. You don't know who your main character is. You don't know why they're on a ship. Like maybe they're on a ship and then all of a sudden you hear cut and that's the director and then everyone leaves the ship. So now you know with that one word where you are, what's important or that that ship isn't important really, you know, because they're actually in a movie. But so just make sure that you understand that when a character speaks, they're showing the reader what's important either to them or to the story. Character um, dialogue can also create texture and feeling to a flat setting or scene. Um, the scene with dialogue is no longer just happening to the reader, right? The reader is now involved. Um, a way to explain this is it's the difference between eavesdropping and participating in a conversation versus looking through the looking at the conversation through a window. And instead of having pages of telling the reader where they are or who they care about or what the conflict is, engage readers with characters talking back and forth, you know, about what is important to them. Like, you know, the castle is damp today or mom forgot her pills again, or the quarterback is giving me the evil eye since last night, that kind of situation. Also adds backstory. Um, and it adds context, the context to the backstory. Now, backstory is important. A lot of us, excuse me, I'm gonna drink some water. A lot of us probably write more backstory than is nece necessary. Um, I know I have like pages and pages of things that readers will never know. <laughs> but uh, backstory can cause reader fatigue. And the reason for that is because backstory isn't necessarily imminent. It's not action right now. And the reader wants to read what's important right now. So it can cause reader fatigue, but adding dialogue helps to know which past facts are actually important to the character and how the world around the character and the person they're talking to reacts to it. Now for all you, I saw a lot of fantasy romance people in here, which I absolutely love. I love fantasy romance. Um, but dialogue is such a useful tool for world building. You get to know your region by the way that people speak, um, who your character is by their region, whether they align with what the region believes or not, um, just by the words they use, you can figure out what they believe. Also, dialect is a deeper dive in describing the people, but just be careful not to overuse it. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. So like examples, maybe this region has perfect speech and this one has simple. There's a lot of reasons why that could be. Um, you could have a person in an ensemble cast or a group of people who talks one way while the group talks a completely different way, showing that the one person is an outsider. Um, exclamations can point to what they believe instead of, oh my God, it's oh my gods. Um, consider your genre above all, <laughs> and then also your time period um, your character and your tone. 
yes, the from what I understand that the recording will be available for later viewing, but um, the Indie Writer Fest um, monitor can help me with that. Um, but you have to think about like genre, time, period, character, and tone, right? Those are all important for world building because for example, you do not want to read or write a medieval epic fantasy heroine who talks like a Gen Z in a TikTok comment, you know, that's a jarring dichotomy and um, it will bring your reader out constantly of what you're writing. You want such an immersive experience. Also, avoid what is called, okay, great. Um, avoid what's called as you know bobbing. <laughs> Um, as you know, bobbing is when characters on the page obviously know a fact. They should know a fact, um, but the reader doesn't know that fact yet, right? So um, you often get this when like two detectives are talking to each other and saying like, um, well, as you know, I, I can't uh, learn anything off of the fingerprint on the watery uh, paper, you know, because water is kind of hard for, for fingerprints. But anyway, so yeah, so, but the reader doesn't know that, but there's a way you can do this, um, deliver that information without being like, as you know, Bob, you know, um, so use, you are creative, you are a writer, you are an author, you are, you create this world, right? So use your creative skills to introduce this fact to the reader by adding in other information, make it more rich, make it um, more informative of who the character is or where they are, uh, use inferences or character quirks. Um, the example I have here is a bridesmaid to Bob, the waiter, who both witnessed the bride coming out of the coat closet with a groomsman. As you know, Bob, the bride cheats on the groom. Or you can have it the way that Panic at the Disco said it, and instead have, what a beautiful wedding, what a beautiful wedding. Janet was first to Bob the waiter as her gaze flicks toward the open coat closet. Shane the poor groom's bride is a shh. <laughs> and then we have another example here. Um, Janet mentions to her friend Bob, as you know, Bob, the restaurant we went to on Monday was expensive. There's not like a lot going on there, right? So instead you could have Janet groans as Bob winces at the old restaurant receipt he found in his pocket. How's that bank account since Monday, Bob? That restaurant blew through my budget, right? Who knew a place called Tokyo Cafe is a Michelin star restaurant? Um, so there's just more creative ways to deliver a fact that two characters already know that the reader does not. Okay, next we have building character with dialogue. Uh, first and foremost, know your character. Whenever they're speaking, you need to know your character. Um, how would they speak normally, right? Like where they're from, um, who they are, how would they speak normally? And then how would they speak in like, you know, a stressful situation? Um, for example, a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so example, we have jaded hero, you know, if he is sarcastic to everyone, but then he becomes sincere when he speaks to a child with cancer or the bubbly nerd who talks like a Twitter entry, um, unless she's afraid and then she's pretty, she's pretty serious. Or the robot who doesn't use contractions until he finds the meaning of what it is to be human, you know? Um, so it's important to kind of consider how the dialogue in the beginning of a story can show the growth and progression or change in a character towards the end. Um, Dialogue can also describe who the character is, which is helpful. Um, and that, like, you can describe who they are and what they are or what they say and how they say it. Um, for example, I'm from Southern Appalachia. Um, we have dropped the letter G from everything that we say, except for at the beginning. We speak in riddles and metaphors. Um, so, you know, this example, instead of saying tired Mary Sue is a devout Christian from the deep South, instead have her say, Lord of mercy, I'm born slap out. I'm fixing to hit the hay before church tomorrow. She didn't curse. She took off the G's. She used idioms. We know more about her 
or we know the same amount. And it's way more interesting than just telling the world what she is or telling the reader who she is or what she is. Um, and it's also extremely different than, you know, a motorcycle gang president from California. <laughs> um, but also one thing with all that being said, use dialect sparingly. You want the reader to have an immersive experience. So maybe you're tempted to drop the G on everything and have, you know, a um, apostrophe instead, or maybe you're, you're wanting them to talk a certain way and you're trying to get that accent just right. But just know like too many missing G's or metaphors or slang or expletives or other markers of dialect can be confusing, repetitive, annoying, or even harmful. Um, write normally, write what they would normally say, right? With enough to identify or make a point about the character. Um, one thing I like to, <laughs> I've noticed about myself is that I, I was reading, I think someone was talking about a, um, I, I don't even know what accent they were trying to do, but the T-O was a T-A, and then uh, tomorrow was T-O-M-O-R-R-A, and then the, there were no Gs and all that stuff. And I could not, for the life of me, get the thought of a pirate out of my head. <laughs> and so I was reading this, and I had to put it down because I just kept on thinking about a pirate, and it was not it was not the romance I was, I was wanting to read at the moment. So avoid pirates unless you're talking about pirates. <laughs> Even then, don't do it too much. Um, character or dialogue can also identify characters. Um, and this is very, very important in, say, like an ensemble cast. And some of you fantasy people, you know how important it is to, um, when you have an ensemble cast, that's a cast of a ton of different characters, right? So um, you often have very a lot of characters that are important in one scene. I have in my six book series, it ended up in, at one point in time having more than 12 people in scenes at some times. And so this was very important. One thing to remember is that dialogue should be like a fingerprint. Um, no two people should speak the same in your book. Um, there should be at least something different. Uh, like I have two characters that kind of speak the same way and um, because they don't curse too much, but one of them definitely curses and one of them only curses when, you know, she's like her life is in danger. Yeah, all the war room scenes. This was so, uh, yeah, so my characters would convene in a war room or a conference room and they had to talk about really important stuff. It was an expositionary type of scene and so to avoid info dumping I had to have dialogue but to avoid it being jarring for the reader I had to make sure that there was minimal action beats and dialogue text so I had to focus on the dialogue itself to make sure that the dialogue spoke for the character and who the character was um one thing to do about that is like you might think oh well no the reader can't possibly know who that is and so one way to make sure that you figure out that the reader can figure out who it is um, is a exercise that I actually learned off of Writing Excuses podcast, and it's to take out everything, right? Um, take out everything but the dialogue, take out the action beats, take out the dialogue tags, take out the prose, um, and then figure out from there if you can tell who's talking. And if you can't tell who's talking, try and dig deep and use words or phrases or punctuation that that character would use. And then once you've done that and you're like, well, you know, they just need to tell this person that E equals MC squared or something like that is pretty cut and dry. Well, then that's when you start adding back the action beats and dialogue tags. Yes, so if you have characters who are, I have a question, so characters should be starkly different and the dialogue should give that away. Character, I know two people are alike. You can have two people who speak exactly the same except for one specific little thing. So in a lot of their scenes, you know, you might still have to have action beats of dialogue tags, but it would be good to know the difference about why the, what this character says and what this character says. Um, and then I have another question. I am writing historical American romance from the 1700s. They spoke with the and stuff, but I'm hoping not to write that way. Um, what I would probably do with that is I would probably write 
pretty stilted in comparison to what today is, at least. Um, I would write like kind of formalized type of language, but I would not use the. Um, I would probably do that sparingly if I did, maybe like in a formal situation or something like that. But I would, it's great that you've looked that up. I would definitely, um, I would definitely look into trying to speak as normally as we do today because you don't want the reader to get taken out every single time a certain word is used. Um, yes, I actually have used research for different dialects, but I do a lot of my um, a lot of my books actually come from the South, like they're in the South, and so I kind of cheat a little bit. But um, I'm writing a book now where I'm going to be studying different different places, and I use stuff like Wikipedia to research different dialects. I use YouTube. All of those are really important, I think, to um, are really great to use. Like there are certain parts of Appalachia that people talk differently. And so I've researched, you know, like the way people in Tennessee talk versus the way people in North Carolina talk. And I use that with YouTube and um, specifically YouTube because you can hear it. Um, and then you can actually translate it in your own words, like how you would do it. But at the same time, while that's all important, um, make sure that you're writing in a way that is um, translatable for the reader like this is something that uh, this is normal like we, we write normally but we like pepper in those dialect things because um, you don't want to do too much or it could actually be pretty harmful in certain scenarios and or it's just like kind of annoying if you do it too much um, or if you have a character that you really want to identify that dialect um, maybe it's a side character or a character who is, you know, just like a blip in the chapter or something. Like, for example, I have a character, her name is Nora. She talks like the internet. She talks like Twitter. Um, she doesn't really curse a whole lot, but when she does, like she still does. But when things get serious, she slows down. Um, and I also, in her book, cause in the first three books, she wasn't the main character. And so in the first three books, it was easy to kind of just have her be almost comedic relief, you know, and um, when we, when I wrote her, it wasn't annoying yet, but whenever I started writing her in book four, I was like, oh my gosh, she cannot keep saying like, I love this, or she cannot keep saying like, um, fricking or like all that kind of stuff. Or uh, what, what is one thing that she, she says, like, like, it's kind of funny because I talk like her a little bit too, but she couldn't do that the whole time or she would be a caricature of herself. And so I had to really dial that back and kind of figure out, well, like in this book, where can I still utilize that part of her that people love and adore without annoying those people? And so what I did was if she was really happy or she was really relaxed, then I would use more of that language but I would still kind of keep with the baseline of a normal person talking, if that makes sense. Um, but whenever she was stressed, she was extremely stilted or she was just straight to the point. Um, and there was no internet at all in her speaking. So that's kind of what I, that's how I did it anyways. Um, Sorry, I'm reading. I have a question. If a character is giving crucial information through dialogue, it tends to become a huge chunk, almost like a monologue, unless the character is interrupted by the listener. Is it okay to show action in the middle of such dialogue? For example, actions like he faced around or he looked. Yes, those are actually, um, those are called action beats. And so a lot of times they're used to kind of introduce like who is talking at the same time, or whenever there's a breakup in a paragraph or breakup where you would naturally put a paragraph in a long quote, quote monologue, um, you can put in normal prose in between. Or if it is a, a first person, then maybe write a little bit about what the other person is hearing. Or if it's first person and that person is talking a bunch, then maybe make sure that um, they have their own thoughts coming out too. And you can pepper in the that like action beats and we kind of we kind of talk a little bit more about this later but action beats provide action 
um, and an otherwise like almost actionless. It's kind of like there's pros where uh, expositionary pros, which is kind of what you're talking about, but with dialogue um, where nothing happens. And then there's also action. Uh, there's also dialogue, which kind of becomes action. But if there's too much dialogue, then the action lessens up and it just feels it causes reader fatigue. Um, so I would definitely pepper in uh, action beats with that, or I would pepper in prose between paragraphs. I would also really analyze how much needs to be said at that time um, and how much can be inferred and how much you can trust a reader to figure it out through action elsewhere. Okay, I have a question that says, I read an article by a editor who says that if a writer uses a dialogue tag that ends in L-Y, such as loudly or quietly, the writer isn't doing their job making the reader understand how the dialogue should come across. He also said to never use anything other than said. Um, I'm not quite sold on this idea. What's your opinion? So I am um, quite a big fan of the thesaurus. And I'm also quite a big fan of a book called Thinking Like a Romance Writer by Dahlia Evans. If you're not a romance writer, this is still really helpful because it points out um, different ways to call different, different things to call different body parts and like what those body parts do. But at the end, it also has like different words for said or voice. And um, I'm, I think personally that, and I'm not saying that person is wrong, but the way I have always understood it is to use very active verbs for dialogue tags. Um, and it is true that you really should use L-Y words sparingly. It, it does show a lot of times, so a lot of times L-Y words can uh, seem like a little bit lazy. And in some places and sometimes it really is because you could think of, you know, like he walked slowly, he trudged or she walked quickly, she ran, you know? Um, there's like different, there are definitely some parts sometimes where one word should be modified by an L-Y, I think. I don't think that there's ever a time where you should never say anything. Um, like saying that you should never do any other word besides said, I think that's kind of limiting. Um, or you should never use L-Ys, I also think that's limiting. Um, those words exist for a reason. They're, they're helpful to the communication and helpful in your writing, but try and limit your L-Y words. I actually, every time I write um, my editing process, the, one of the last things I do, or one of the things I do in my editing process is that I do what's called control F or like I find in the document and I search for every L-Y word. And um, I go through, because whenever I'm writing, it is kind of lazy. That's like the quickest way to like, oh, well, she walked quickly, done. And whenever I go back, I'm like, walked quickly. She sprinted, she ran, she uh, power walked or something like that. And I'll change that. But I would definitely, um, I would definitely do what feels right for you. If you look through your document and you have used the L-Y word 10,000 times and you have a, um, you know, 100,000 word document, you might want to like check it out. <laughs> there, there might be times where you can make your work more powerful, your action beats more or your uh, dialogue tags more powerful and your action beats more powerful. Um, someone says that has been hard for me too I've heard both I think traditional classics only you said I feel like more modern works is different words than other than said that is very true a lot of the information that you get from um classic instructors is very different than what you would get now reading um reading normal or not normal <laughs> or contemporary works you know um J.K. Rowling uses L-Y in Harry Potter. My understanding is that L-Y should be used sparingly. Yes, it should be used sparingly. It does depend on the audience. Um, there are just better ways to make sure that your work is more active. And that's where you use like thesaurus or something like that. But L-Y isn't like the, <laughs> L-Y isn't the devil, but sometimes you need to check out the details. <laughs> um, okay, so when 
you're talking about a um, ensemble cast, for example, you need to, uh, another way you can do things is like giving characters quirks, even in their speech. Um, but then after that, like I said, adding action beats or dialogue tags or just prose to kind of uh, to space it out. Um, Okay, someone did point out something that's very helpful, and I actually talk about it a little bit later, um, how said is invisible in dialogue, and that's very true. I do talk about this later, but um, just in case I don't get to it, I'm going to throw it out there. I actually grew up hearing don't say said at all, which is interesting that other people are saying that um, it's the opposite. I've heard that I've heard don't say said at all. So um from what I understand, though, is it is said is invisible in dialogue until like um, Inca says it, it is not anymore. And so I would kind of go through like I do this with everything, though. I go through and I find search and find all the words that as I was writing, I was like, mm, I feel like I'm using this a lot and I'll put it to the side. I'll put the word there. And then at the end, I'll go through and see if I can do it more. Oh, I can go through the find find function and weed those out if that makes sense um but said if you know if the character the characters have already, already like talked or um warbled or sang or cried or <laughs> informed or demanded you know said is old faithful and um I just wouldn't use it for everything but it definitely is helpful if the person just literally said something. If there's nothing that you're really even trying to point out with the sentence except for something important, it said it's totally fine. Um, and then the last thing I would like to discuss on this one is skip the hi, how are you's for character. Um, you, I don't know about you guys, I hate small talk. I hate it. I am an introvert. And so I'd rather, much rather talk about our hopes and dreams than talk about the weather. Um, it's awkward a lot of times it's silted it's boring and so that that translates to your writing so what I would suggest is to start where small talk ends um and if the characters don't have anything to talk about but small talk then don't make them talk um and then there's also you know the stylistic choice of bringing small talk into the conversation and there's merit in that too but like I said with everything you have to have a reason for it um, maybe you want to bring in small talk for building tension in the story or between the characters. If it's between the characters, um, add action beats to show feeling or reaction or body language or metaphorical prose is to illustrate why they're talking with only small talk. Um, maybe the character is shy around him, but not others. Or maybe they had a magical moment last night that they literally never want to talk about ever again. <laughs> or maybe one of them thinks the other is a killer. There's also um, scene tension. And I've seen this used before and I've definitely seen it. Um, I've actually used it before and it was interesting to do it because I had to kind of pull back a little bit because I was like, oh, there's just way too much in this. But um, when you do kind of mundane things at the beginning of a chapter um, and so you can have those mundane conversations and, um, but I would, what I learned whenever I was doing that is to make sure that if you're building up or for slamming down the suspense thriller punchline hammer, um, make it quick. You know, um, the reader gets the gist that this is just kind of like a mundane thing, but you never want to have it be so long, the conversation of small talk or anything to be so long that the reader is wondering, why am I reading this? Um, I once heard names and tags on single dialogue line. I'm not really sure what that means. If you would like to ask, uh, if you would like to rephrase the question, I would love to answer. Yeah, reading the dialogue out loud is the best reality check when I go through my manuscript. Exactly, I have that in here as like a way to make sure things sound pretty. <laughs> um, so one way that you can use dialogue is also to advance the plot. Um, and here I've actually talked a little bit about different types of scenes that I definitely have in my own writing. And um, for example, detective or expository scenes, we've kind of gone over those a little bit, but they can be pretty information heavy. So 
try not to info dump or as you know, Bob, <laughs> use creative ways to kind of introduce more about the character or more about the plot um, through that dialogue and um, pepper it in to make sure that you're not info dumping as much. And then we also have action scenes. Action scenes are so fun for me to write. I love them so much, but there's not a lot of dialogue in those. Um, and it makes sense because if you think about real life situations, um, you are forced to usually use like clipped quick sentences or um, action packed and full of purpose sentences. For example, like you wouldn't be like, hey man, look at that. There's a gun pointed at us. That's so crazy. What's going to happen? You wouldn't have that. You would say, gun, watch out. Done. You know? So whenever you have action scenes, focus on those clipped quick sentences. Make sure that they have a lot of purpose. Um, also with action scenes specifically, I've been called out by beta readers a lot about this sometimes. It's, can they hear you? You know? Um, so always consider setting. Uh, envision the scene and what's possible or probable for character interaction. Make sure that they're together or like close by at least to be able to talk or make sure that there's not gunfire in a metal building because they're gonna have to scream at each other. They can't whisper sweet nothings, you know? Um, yeah, no one talks a lot when they know they're about to die, exactly. Um, and then this is also a great way to showcase character. Um, we talked a little bit about with uh, character dialogue. It's you have to figure out how a character would talk normally and then figure out what they would talk like with in a stressful situation. This is definitely one of those. Um, this is definitely one of those situations where you would you could showcase character or an ensemble cast. Um, I have like I, I said before, I have a character who says freaking, but whenever her life is in danger, that's when she says the one bad word she said the entire book. And then I have Phoenix who um, cracks jokes when he's being shot at because he's kind of had his villain origin story. And he's a little bit jaded. And then we have Wes who, whenever he gets nervous, um, he over explains and people have to kind of calm him down or tell him like, okay, we get it. Um, well, there's a there's a, a big comment. Um, let's see, unless they are pleading to be spared. If they're pleading to be spared, I would kind of probably, depending on what happened just before, I would maybe consider this being a sequel. Um, a sequel scene is one where characters can convene or go over action-packed scenes. It's the action has been drawn down a little bit. Um, depending on how long you're pleading to be spared, you know, um, if it's like a whole chapter of pleading to be spared, these are times where, yeah, you can actually, you can definitely have longer sentences. Um, you can show more about the character in those sentences and um, you can build character relationships together in other situations too. Um, so let's see, just give me a, just give me a breath. Let me read this real quick. When you write a dialogue, do you think there's also a better way to present them to keep the reader in your story, keep up with it? I mean, for example, in French book, every dialogue starts by a dash and at the line. Um, I'm not uh, totally sure what that means. Um, Okay, I am Anna. Okay, nice to meet you. So I really only know English punctuation. I'm sorry. Um, but a lot of times punctuation or um, I think someone mentioned before about uh, below about formatting. A lot of that is also like uh, editing work. Like I will do, there's, there's rarely a time where I use action beats correctly with a period. I will do a comma or something like that just out of, um, Right, I think these are, I think the question that we have here is actually, I can only really speak to English um, from America and the way that we write. I haven't studied the way punctuation works in other books, um, but that's definitely an interesting question. I will have to look into that more, but I don't have anything for you right now, I'm sorry. Um, 
Okay, someone has a question about neutral and casual dialogue uh, is the bane of my existence. Have you got any ideas on or ways to make those sort of conversations work? I often feel like I'm dragging those students on. Okay, this is amazing. This is a really great, a really great, ugh, great question. Okay, um, when you go into a scene and you know these characters have to talk to each other, the first, if you're a plotter or if you're a pantser, I'm sorry, this is kind of plot work, <laughs> but you should figure out exactly what those characters should say in that scene. And if you don't know yet, maybe write the scene and then kind of come up with the dialogue later. That's like one trick you can do. Um, dialogue pretty much comes pretty easily to me because um, I, whenever I write, it's like a movie in my head. But decide what's important to that character and what's important for the reader to know in that scene. And then try and weave that into the conversation. And whenever you're doing um, casual dialogue, it, you, casual dialogue should still have a purpose. You shouldn't, um, you should be figuring out when you write what that character should be saying or what that char character should be talking about. And um, whenever you figure out what they're gonna talk about, think about the character themselves. How would that character bring about that information? Is it information they don't wanna talk about? And so they're gonna kind of like pussyfoot around and like not talk about it for a little while. Maybe they do the small talk thing or are they head on and headstrong? And so they're just gonna bust through the door and straight up talk about it. Like don't even give anybody a breath, that kind of situation. So talk about, think about how your character would react and if you don't know how your character would react, I would maybe try and get to know your character a little bit more, maybe figure out their backstory, figure out where they're from, figure out what their goals are, what they hate, what they love, um, what they want, what they think they want and what they need. Those are sometimes different things. Um, so if you feel like those scenes are dragging on after you've done all that, then I would pepper in more action beats or pros, or I would see if that's even something that needs to be talked about then. Um, a lot of times if things are boring, it's probably because they are. And so you need to figure out what is important for that scene. And if it is not important, cut it or put it somewhere else. If it's important for later, use it later and figure out how to put it later. That's kind of how I would, um, suggest neutral, ca neutral or casual dialogue. I hope that helped. <laughs> um, have a, great. Um, I have a hard time writing dialogue in the sense that all the characters end up sounding like me. How do I write dialogue of a character who is, for example, a genius? Do I just need to research these types of characters more through movies, reading, observing people in real life? Maybe the problem is I don't know my characters enough. Thanks. Um, that is such a great, great question. I love that question. Um, if you are a writer, I will tell you right now, go people watch. Um, this is so people laugh at me all the time because I don't really watch dramas too much. Um, but I will watch reality shows like it's my job. Um, because in my head, it kind of is. Um, I feel like when I'm watching reality shows, I'm watching like a microcosm of a certain type of person. And I internalize that as a character and I figure out like, how would this character react? Like, how would this person um, do this? Because I feel like after lots of therapy, <laughs> I've become pretty well adjusted. And so sometimes whenever I write a not well adjusted character, I need to watch someone or read about someone who's not, and it helps me kind of see that other perspective, if that makes sense. Um, yes, airports are great for people watching, best place to pick up story ideas. The mall is also great. Um, I would do reality shows. I, I'm telling you, reality shows are so great for kind of seeing also like um, different types of body language. Um, you can really kind of see you know, scrunch of the eyebrows, like when they did that, when that type of person would do that, that kind of thing. Salons are great also. Um, but yeah, so I would go people watching. And if it's a person who's smarter than you, what I would do is research the heck out of what that person's smarter than you at. And um, then talk around it. I would rarely, if I don't know a subject, do I talk about it in my book? Um, 
because there's going, always going to be someone who knows more than me, right? Um, so I take certain things, certain small things, where whenever I'm writing, I will focus on that small thing. And it's a small, like little tiny thing. And so people will assume that the bigger things are correct. Um, because they've trusted me. They're like, oh, you know, that person knows this small, tiny, minute detail. Obviously, they know what they're talking about. And so that's what I would do with a genius. I would kind of skirt around anything that you don't know, uh, research the heck out of what they do know, and then talk about the things that you feel most confident about with the genius. Um, and that's how I would write the dialogue of a genius. I also would explore different ways that people who are geniuses talk um, I think a lot of geniuses are really smart, but some of them, God bless them, are a little bit um, not great at the whole uh, conversating with or conversing with other people. And so I would um, definitely research those people and um, researching like what they would, how they would talk and maybe they talk more stilted or maybe they get straight to the point whenever they talk or whenever they um I would just that so basically to answer your question in a very small nutshell go research everyone and if you have a certain type of person that you're thinking about writing try and like literally research that type of person and I would do that um answer live done okay uh let's see Okay, yes, I'm telling you, reality shows, if you put on your writer lens, it's a completely different show, because you're like, oh, man, this person acts this way, I can actually figure this out, and you can see, like, where they come from different, like, why would they say that, that seems so detrimental to them in this situation, but then if you think about everything else you know about that person, you can see why they would, that type of person would come up with that type of um, conversation, um, let's see. Then we have just going back to advancing plot with dialogue. We have emotionally charged scenes. These are the high and low scenes. Um, but again, try to avoid reader fatigue because if whenever you're writing, your goal should be to make the reader feel something. Um, your readers should be able to feel the love and the hate in your book or the despair or the triumph. They should be able to feel that kind of thing. Um, and so in those situations, your dialogue shouldn't be too wordy. Um, they should be concise. They should be informative and get to the point. Be clear about the conflict or the revelation that you're trying to portray in those conversations. Um, but it shouldn't go on too long because one, the reader stops caring. It's kind of like a real fight, you know, um, at some point you kind of get tired of having the fight. And then two, the reader starts uh, getting confused as to what we're even really talking about anymore. Um, and that's just like real life too. So like in real life, you might have a five hour breakup with your boyfriend, but in a book, got to get to the point. Okay. And so speaking of uh, boyfriends, <laughs> let's talk about dialogue and romance, which is one of my favorite things. Um, let me look over these really quickly. So give me a breath for a second. Um, okay, yes, Cheryl has a really great, inf uh, really great, um, suggestion and, um, Janine and City, I hope that's, I'm sorry if that's not how to pronounce your name, um, these are three, if you can read in the chat, these are three really great examples of how geniuses are so different, right? Um, because we have in the first one, we have, you know, the genius is an introvert. And so he knows various facts and he throws in now and then. Um, and then the second one, it sounds like the character who's smart always speaks in big words. Maybe that person has a God complex and like a, I mean, I'm sorry if someone's a surgeon out there, but surgeons have to be really confident in what they do because they have lives in their hands and so maybe they have a god complex and maybe they are um that type of genius or maybe they're like the spencer reed in criminal minds i haven't seen that show i know <laughs> don't don't be mean to me i know i haven't seen it but um that these are all three examples of 
people that you can go watch or you can think about like how is your genius or how is your introvert or your extrovert or your party girl or your football player or your I mean like that kind of thing how would they act go out into the world and learn it and then write it okay so studying romance dialogue we have here you must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you oh it's the best quote probably in all of classic romance um personally <laughs> let's see um but if you are not a romance writer which I know a few of you are not here it is I think you should really consider looking into romance dialogue because it can better your craft um and it can show you tension how important tension is between two characters or body language or um how a character relationship develops over time through dialogue um so body language for example helps to show that characters are hiding feelings from each other that is the tension that you could research if you're not a romance writer um and then one thing to remember with um body language is that's that's not someone talking so maybe in your book you might have internal dialogue and I love internal dialogue it's great it gives you like a pointed and like a point of view as to what your character is thinking about or what the character is thinking about but it provides explanation and it doesn't show anything so I think showing it is better showing the dialogue or the body language or the actual dialogue is better because internal dialogue has no effect on the other character. Um, well, body language, for example, shows the character's intention and motivation. Um, is your character saying she hates him but gravitates closer as they argue? Is he trying to be respectful and keep his hands off her but keeps finding himself watching her lips while she speaks? Is it Mr. Darcy's flexed hand after they say goodbye? Um, that is, those are the types of body language that is really important to convey um, subtleties to a reader. Their dialogue should also evolve with the relationship. Um, and you can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, you can have her, she didn't talk before and now she does. She was joking before and now she's not. Um, like that means like, was she quiet before and now she's opening up? Is he mean to everyone but her? Um, that's a classic. <laughs> is this enemies to lovers and he hated her and was mean to her before, but now he calls her sweetheart. Um, and these are also things that you should kind of think about too, the sweetheart, because readers love, 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 love pet names. Um, but there all, always has to be a reason for the pet name. That's why people love them. It's because there's a reason and intention behind it. Um, and also if there is a difference in the way a character was speaking versus the character is speaking now, you should really use that as a character progression moment. And I interview your character for the reader and have them show how she reacts to it or does she love it or is she not ready? Whenever she is ready, how does she react? That kind of thing. We also have steamy scenes. Um, I won't go too in depth with these <laughs> um, because uh, I know not everyone in this chat um, reads or writes romance. Um, let me ch check really quickly with the chat. Um, let's see. Yes, body language is so great for a um, romance, I think anyways. And I, I feel like it's proven correct if you look at all these other romance books. Um, uh, when there is a group conversation or argument, there are a lot of instances of A said, B said, C said, and again, A interrupted. Does mentioning character's name multiple times bring readers out of the scene? What to do in such situation as it is necessary to specify who's talking? Okay, yeah, we actually discussed that a little bit with the action beats and the dialogue tags and I'm, and, and I'm Sable cast. Um, and I know I've said a lot, so let me just kind of repeat it because this is really important. This is a really important question. Um, having a lot of dialogue tags and a lot of action beats in your writing 
can take the reader out, but I, out of the story, I would really um, depend on your beta readers and your alpha readers, or um, if you could analyze it and look, and if you're saying something after every single person is talking, remind yourself that action beats, for example, are a pause in the conversation. And so that action beat mentally for the reader, the conversation is being paused. Do you want that? If not, um, try and make sure that the dialogue itself is points to the character. And if you cannot do that, then yeah, I would do action beats and dialogue text. But my suggestion for you though, is if you have a first draft that says A said, B said, C said, and A interrupted, I would take everything out. I, if you really, if you can't figure out where to do that already, I would take everything out. It's kind of a fun exercise. And then go through and see if you can tell who is saying what. And um, if you can't tell, that's when you add an action B or a dialogue tag. And whenever you can tell it, you can kind of leave it alone. But that's what I would suggest for you or for anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, I will go over these things really quickly. I'm sorry, it's been a long while. Um, steamy scenes. Less dialogue is more, but none at all is awkward. Remember different words for each character. A 20 year old inexperienced woman is gonna say things very differently than a 35 year old military hardened man. Um, and then uh, there's also like actually dialogue specific schminks. <laughs> so definitely look into those, those are fun. Um, the thing though that you should remember is sweet wins every time. So sweet is basically what's outside the bedroom. Sweet wins. Consider love languages. Um, like sweet words are great, uh, but when it's in combination with a, if that's words of affirmation, when it's in combination with an acts of service or a, like he's opening the door for her or gives her a new wardrobe, which is gifts or proximity trope where they're hanging out all the time. Um, and that is uh, quality time. Or when she reaches for his hand, does he gasp at the touch because he's never held hands before? That's touch. Really play on love languages and stuff like that too, because that's pretty fun. Um, you want your readers to fall in love with the characters before they do, or it's going to feel pressured. And sweet scenes, sweet dialogues will do that for you. Um, and let's see, let's go through these really quickly. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, what readers don't say or what characters don't say is just as important sometimes as what they do. Um, we kind of already talked a lot about this uh, with, you know, monologues like the villain monologue, try not to do that because that's early 2000s, it's kind of tried out. Um, and then when, or if you do that, because I have a character, like I've said, he just goes long winded whenever he's stressed out, people point, you point it out. And again, if you do that, don't do it too much. Readers get that after like the second or third time. So you don't, you can trust your reader to think, to know what's going on. Um, and if a character doesn't talk about something, you should have a reason for why they don't talk about it because it could turn into what's called the miscommunication trope, which is just very stressful to readers, has broken many a Kindle. Um, you can talk around it with body language, metaphor, innuendo, um, that kind of thing. And don't let your characters be mind readers unless they're like literally mind readers. <laughs> but even quiet characters need to talk sometime if something needs to be spelled out to another character. Okay, and then make it look sound pretty. We've kind of already talked about it, like analyze what the page looks like and um, avoid overuse of action beats. And um, when, if it feels weird when a, in real life person say things, would your character say things? read it out loud, someone suggested that, try to imagine like the scene in a movie. And if it's weird, take it out, figure it out. Um, and if other people say it's not weird and you can trust them, then I would trust them. Um, and aside from all of this, above all, trust your alpha and beta readers because they will not steer you wrong. Um, I have like 12 and they're amazing. Um, here are my favorite resources, my advice at the bottom, if you wanna look back on it. Um, just write the damn book. And um, there's a lot after that, but just definitely just write it. 
And then we have Q&A. I've kind of already gone through those. And here's my thank you for listening, guys. Y'all are so great. Um, I think I'm out of time, but I've really enjoyed this. If you guys want, uh, you can follow me on my newsletter, join my Facebook group reach out to me if you have any questions i'll try to answer i kind of don't talk to anybody between five and midnight because i um am writing but i really enjoyed spending this time with you guys you guys are great make sure to enter the giveaway there's the forms are in the chat um, my facebook group is greer rivers babes and so you can research it but yeah thank you guys so much um Thank you. I think if you, again, if you have any more questions, ask a girl. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'll try my best. <laughs> okay. Bye, all. <laughs>